This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. When Patricia Tear Carlton awoke from surgery for a brain aneurysm, she found she could no longer remember her name, where she lived, or that she had two children. Eight times over the next few years, Pat would wander off without explanation. Finally, on the ninth time, she vanished forever. In 1976, Daryl Tacey fell in love with and later married an exotic young woman named Georgia Ann Boyd. After a series of strange incidents, including a high-speed chase by members of a biker gang, Daryl realized that Georgia was a woman of mystery whose past would remain hidden even in death. And in Florida, a murder investigation has stalled because no one can identify the victim. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve this very unusual mystery. spring day in 1967, Mary Urich of Houston, Texas, was on her way to visit her sister Pat, as she did nearly every day. Suddenly, Mary was overcome by a feeling of dread. The further down the road I got, the faster I would drive, because it was just like I could feel it in my bones. I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't pinpoint it. And I pulled into the driveway, and her little boy, Eugene, he was in the doorway, the door wide open, and... Was your mommy? I knew then that uh, something was wrong because Pat didn't allow the children out by themselves at all. And then I found Sheila in the kitchen. She had pulled a chair up to the kitchen sink and had turned the water on. Sheila was mommy. And she was just having a field day with the water and the dishes. The water was all over the counters. It went all in the floor. And I said, Sheila, where's Mama? Where's Mama? Oh, Mama's asleep. Patricia? Patricia? I went into the bedroom, and I saw Pat laying halfway on the bed and half off. And I tried to waken her, and I could not waken her. I'll be right back. I'll get somebody. I'll be right back. At the hospital, doctors discovered that an aneurysm was blocking the blood flow to Pat's brain. Surgery to correct the condition was risky. An artery in her neck had to be clamped off. The operation saved Pat's life, but there was an unexpected complication. I went back to see her the next day, and she would look at me as if, like, well, who are you? What are you doing here? She didn't know who I was. She didn't know her husband. How are you feeling? You feel better now? She didn't know anything. Everything was She's gone. Great, she woke up into a different world than what she went to sleep in. Pat did not recognize her children at all. She looked at me and she says, who are they? I said, Pat, they are your children. Jean, Sheila. Then your mommy looked pretty today. How do you remember these pretty babies, don't you? Pat had to be taught everything again, even how to eat. It was all too much for her husband. 
he filed for divorce and was granted custody of the children. In November of 1968, a woman who had been hired to look after Pat called Mary at work. Pat had disappeared. I immediately hung the phone up and went home and started searching for her. I went everywhere. I had really hoped that she was still in the Houston area. Six weeks later, Pat was picked up for vagrancy nearly 700 miles away in Alabama, where she and Mary had lived when they were young. They had found papers in her purse stating who she was because she didn't know who she was or anything. I left that night and I drove all night the next day and, got, and picked her up. Do you remember how you got all the way to Alabama? I don't know. I don't know how I got here. Darling, we were so worried about you. So we were sick worried about you. I'm sorry. So oh, sorry. I'm just glad you're all right. I'm just glad you're all right. Are you ready to go home? Yes, I want to go home. Pat's memory home. never fully returned, but eventually her life took on a semblance of normality. Pat even attracted a suitor, Troy Carlton, a construction worker. Oh, got company. The first time I met Pat, I went by Nathan and Mary's house, her sister and brother-in-law. Had it, folks. And I walked in, and there was Pat. Fine. Fine. Come here. I want to introduce you to my sister-in-law. Mary. Troy Carlton. It's Patricia Snyder. Patricia, this is my good friend, Troy. Howdy. Nice to meet you. Hello. Neither I made some kind of remark about oh, it man. being recess in heaven with angels running around there, and next thing you know, we were dating. Would you like something to drink, Troy? Lemonade? Sure, that sounds wonderful. Hey, hey. Put your chair. All right, Put you right you. here next to the angel. Hey, don't blow my cover. <laughs> It was a magnetism between us. When I first met Pat, I was unaware totally of any medical problems. When I was made aware of the fact that she had these problems, uh, it, didn't, it didn't decrease my feelings for her, not in any way. If anything, they increased through concern. Pat and Troy Carlton were married on January 3rd, 1969. Troy urged Pat to fight for custody of her children, and a court hearing was scheduled for that May. Seven days before the hearing, Troy came home for lunch at noon, as he did every day. Hey, Patricia! Laying on the dining Patricia? room table was her purse, a wallet, keys, the money she had in her purse. Every, uh, none of her clothes were gone. Pat was gone. Finally, I called Mary, her sister. She said, well, I haven't seen Pat. I said, well, I haven't either since early this morning. I went to the shop, went to the bank, went to pay on the furniture, and when I got back, she's gone. I haven't seen her in the hide of her. At which time Mary responded, oh, Lord. I said, what you mean, oh, Lord? She said, I bet Pat walked off. I said, what in the hell are you talking about, Pat walked off? Three weeks of desperate searching went by. Finally, Pat was sighted on the other side of Houston. Troy immediately drove to pick her up. Stranger. Hello, sweetie. Are you mad at me? No, sweetie. You want to go home? Yes. You want to get in the truck? Okay. I don't have any idea where she ever went. I don't have any idea why she went. I don't know what she did while she was gone. She never discussed it, period.
Troy assumed Pat's disappearance was an isolated episode, but he could not have been more wrong. Pat would wander off without explanation seven more times within the next year. The last time Pat left was on the 14th day of January of 1971. One year and 11 days after we got married in Conroe, Texas. She had no identification with her, no anything. So I know that this wasn't a planned thing. This wasn't a put on or anything like of that nature. OK, Patricia. Hi. You want to come with me? We'll go ahead and make that call for you. For 13 months, Pat seemed to have dropped off the face of the earth. Then she surfaced in San Diego, California. Evidently, her memory had returned, at least in part. She gave a welfare worker her maiden name, as well as her birthplace. It's hello. Um, I'm trying to locate the family of a Patricia. The welfare worker did find one of Pat's aunts in Birmingham, but she believed Pat was still in Houston and did nothing to follow up. That was the last time anybody ever saw or heard from Pat Carlton. She's been here for uh, one month. Pat has now been missing for more than 22 years. Eventually, Troy Carlton remarried, but with his current wife's support, he is doing everything he can to aid in the search. I couldn't live with Pat again. I'm married for 17 and a half years now. I've raised two stepchildren, one of my own. I, I wouldn't trade what I've got for anything in the world. But I would like to find out that Pat is alive, healthy, and I'd like to see her have the happiness that she deserves. She has been gone a long time, but I don't never quit believing that she's out there somewhere. She's with somebody. I've got to believe that she is with somebody. And they know that she has a problem. And I'm hoping and praying it's somebody that has been good to her, to take care of her. That's all that I can ask for. Next, authorities need your help to solve the brutal murder of a young cab driver. Nestled in the snow-capped Canadian Rockies is the popular resort town of Banff, Alberta, Canada. Visitors from around the world come to this idyllic setting to bask in the natural surroundings and enjoy the peaceful, friendly atmosphere. It was just these qualities that appealed to 21-year-old Lucy Termel of Levy, Quebec, Canada. Lucy moved to Banff in the fall of 1987 and found work as a part-time cab driver. Lucy came here for paradise, and Banff was known as the paradise town. Everything was great for her. Uh, the people, the place, uh, the way of life, uh, everything was great for Lucy. May 17, 1990 was a typical night on the job for Lucy Termel. She logged in at 8 p.m. and spent much of the evening working the downtown tourist trade. As the end of her shift approached, she had taken in just over $100. At 1.40 a.m., Lucy arrived at the Works nightclub on Spray Avenue, hoping to pick up one last fare. There, she talked to another cab driver, Larry Londrio. Not bad yourself? Uh, not too bad. It was uh, about uh, 1.30, 20 to 2 in the morning. Had a little conversation, at which time I had looked out my window to take a look at them. It was a gentleman and two girls. Just seemed normal. Yeah, I got a three, four, six hundred cougar from the works. Lucy called in her destination to the dispatcher, Bruce Ferry Ancheck, and drove away. I'd done a few more fares, at which time I had asked Bruce if Lucy had phoned in. And he said, no, I haven't heard from her. 
And this was about 12 minutes later. We started asking for her on the radio, at which time she did not answer. And after about 20 minutes, finally decided to look for her. Larry drove to Lucy's last reported destination and then passed her house. Less than a block away, he spotted Lucy's cab. But Lucy was not driving. Is that you in front and of me? And I'd asked Bruce right away. I said, are you in front of me, Bruce? And he said, no. And right away, he replied, well, the guy stole in the cab. But at the same time, I had the bad feeling, you know, where was Lucy? How come she hasn't phoned us and said her cab has been stolen? And I told him, I said, well, I got the guy. Larry tailed a stolen cab for two miles at speeds of up to 80 miles an hour. Finally, he cornered the cab on a dead-end street. Larry caught a brief glimpse of the driver, who then disappeared into the woods. At virtually that same moment, police were responding to a report of a body lying in the middle of Squirrel Street, two miles away. Lucy Turmel was dead. She had been stabbed repeatedly in the neck. It was the first murder that had occurred here in 20 years. Uh, there hasn't been anything like it since. And uh, it's, it's a shock to the people that live here that a crime like this could occur in a place like Banff. We were missing her wallet and her yellow jacket, which she'd been wearing. The wallet was subsequently recovered. Our best information is that robbery was the motive for this murder. She had probably about $100 in taxi fares in the cab when the killing occurred, and that money is missing. When police examined Lucy's cab, they found blood spattered on the dashboard, front seat, and steering wheel. Oddly, lab tests would determine that none of the blood was Lucy's. We're surmising that the attack on her took place outside the taxi, and that the attacker somehow cut himself during the attack and bled inside the taxi while he occupied it for the 20 or 25 minutes after the offense occurred. What we don't know is whether the person who killed her was her last fare, may have been in the taxi with her and forced her to get out, or it also could have been somebody who flagged her down and dragged her out of the taxi and then stabbed her. Hi there. Nigel Patterson. Thanks. 18 hours after Lucy Termel was killed, the murder weapon was found in the driveway of a local resident. Police learned that it had been stolen from a hotel employee leading them to believe that the killer may have been from out of town. We've interviewed a lot of people. We did neighborhood inquiries. We were unable to find anybody who had seen or heard anything at the time of Lucy's death. Uh, that is kind of unusual because at that time of morning, there's usually people out on the street, but it's unfortunate, but that's what we're stuck with. For Lucy Termel, the search for a better life had ended in tragedy, all for $100. For Lucy's friends and family, the search for answers continues. When we learned that Lucy died, it took us a while to realize that it was true. We're just living a nightmare, that's all. And it's been two years now, and uh, we're trying to get some answers. And we're hoping that somebody have the answer and do something about it. When we return, a man searched for his late wife's family could help identify a mysterious illness. July 
July 1976, two young servicemen, both stationed at Fort Gordon, Georgia, were taking in the Richmond County Fair. One of them, Darrell Tacey, met a woman who called herself Georgia Ann Boyd. What attracted me to Georgia, I think, was uh, the dark hair and real dark eyes. It was kind of like a mystery. You know, I wanted to know who she was, meet her, talk with her. She was just interesting. Georgia told Darrell that her father was a Cherokee Indian, that she was born on a reservation in North Carolina. She said most people called her Jerry, not Georgia. Darrell Tacey fell head over heels in love. Over the next two and a half years, until Georgia's untimely death, Darrell would discover that she was a woman of mystery, vague about her past and her identity. Today, nearly 14 years later, Darrell hopes someone in our audience can help him find the truth about Georgia Ann Boyd. On the night after they met, Darrell was surprised to discover that Georgia worked at a go-go bar in Augusta, three miles from Fort Gordon. Darrell was soon spending every free moment at the bar watching Georgia dance. Georgia told Darrell she was divorced. She and her two young daughters, Sally and Angel, lived with an older woman Georgia Roger. called Granny, but who Darrell would later learn was not a blood relative. Granny, this is Darrell. Hi, Darrell. Within two weeks, Georgia and her daughters moved into Darrell's house. It wasn't long before Darrell noticed that Georgia was paranoid about something or someone. At home, she kept the curtains tightly closed, even during the day. She refused to answer the phone, except when Darrell called using a prearranged sequence of rings. Georgia finally admitted that she was afraid her ex-husband would try to kidnap the children. A month after they had moved in together, Darrell arrived at the club one night to find Georgia talking to two men in suits and ties, clearly not regular customers. I asked her who they were, and she said, they're nobody really. She says, don't worry about it. And that was the, we just dropped it from there because I trusted her. No. Two weeks later, Three members of the Devil's Disciples, an outlaw motorcycle gang, showed up at the club. No, you go back to Elena and tell them to forget. She was scared, and I asked her what's wrong, and she said, "I used to run with the Disciples in Atlanta, what was that all about? and they're here to take me back." Atlanta, don't worry, I'm not gonna let anybody take you away from me. Okay. That same night, when Georgia and Daryl left the club, the three motorcycle gang members were waiting. We tried to lose a van. We were running red lights, stop signs, and, but the van was staying with us. They're right on us! All right, hang on, hang on. They're right behind us! When a police car began to give pursuit, Darrell fishtailed onto a side street. The van sped away. Georgia never offered any further explanation about the devil's disciples. She would not say anything what she was really doing with them. She did not say if any of these were the father of the children or anything. And she just really did not want to talk about it. And if she didn't want to talk about it, she wouldn't say a word about it at all. In January of 1977, the Army reassigned Darrell to Fort Ord across the country in Northern California. On the trip west, he and Georgia were married. Can I help you with that? No, but you can get the door. Georgia and Darrell arrived at Fort Ord in February of 1977. Georgia was pregnant, and it seemed that their troubles were far behind them. 
However, a few months later, someone began harassing Georgia, usually when Darrell worked late. On one occasion, a stalker arrived when Daryl was at home. I don't see anybody, babe. We called the MPs. They came over and checked around the house, and they couldn't find anything or anybody. Several days later, the intruder left one final calling card. Painted on the back door was a warning of Get You Jet. Daryl thought Jet, like Jerry, might be one of George's nicknames, but she denied it. She told me that she would tell me everything about her past at a later date. She just did not want me to know a lot of things that could hurt me. And she asked me if anything ever happened to her to please take care of her children. And I said I would. On August 10th, 1977, Georgia gave birth to a son, she suffered complications, and Darrell was granted a hardship discharge. They moved back to his hometown in Michigan, where Georgia became pregnant again. After their second son was born, she began to have violent headaches. All right. Jerry? Jerry, doctor says you gotta start getting up, okay? You gotta start getting up and walking around. It's the only way your headaches are gonna go away. Well, after a couple of weeks of this, I called an ambulance because she could not get up to even go to the bathroom anymore. The ambulance came and picked her up and took her to the hospital. Jerry, Jerry. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. Georgia lapsed into a coma. The diagnosis, a brain aneurysm. Technically, Georgia was brain dead. Any change? Yeah, we've done all we can for her. Test today didn't show any indication of a change. Why don't you spend some time with her? Then come see me in my office. Is there a chance? I don't think so, Daryl. I was informed by the doctor that I can tell them to shut the machine off. Georgia Ann Boyd Tacey was only 22 years old when she died. She left behind two daughters from her first marriage, two young sons from her marriage to Darrell, and a mysterious legacy of unanswered questions. Just after Jerry died, I tried to contact some family of hers. I called information to get the number to her father. They gave me a number and I called and the gentleman that answered said, I don't know who you're talking about. I have no daughters, I have no children at all. I'm sorry, Bob, yeah. Daryl says he could never get a response from the Cherokee Nation about Georgia or her father. He was also unable to locate her mother through the sketchy information Georgia had given him. It appeared that Georgia's identity had died with her. Daryl returned to Augusta, hoping to unravel the mystery of Georgia's life. I'm sorry, man. I don't know any Georgia. She's never worked here. I'm busy, OK? Ryan. Hey, look, pal, why don't you just get out of At the go-go club, right? the manager acted as if he had oh, never God. heard of Georgia. I talked to a couple other dancers about her that knew her from before, and 
One of the girls said, just drop it, let it go, and leave town, get out. I said, why? She said, you don't want to know anything, just drop it and get away. Daryl convinced a local TV station to broadcast this picture of Georgia over a period of 24 hours. However, the picture was shown only once. When Daryl asked why, he said he was told once again, forget about her and leave town. According to Daryl, the Augusta police replied to his inquiries in the same evasive manner. Nobody I talked to would give me any information. Everybody said, leave, leave. So I was running low on money from motel rooms and eating and everything, and I had to leave. And I left Augusta, not knowing any more than when I left Michigan to go there. Nearly 14 years have passed since Georgia's death. Her daughters are now grown. Although Daryl has remarried, neither he nor Georgia's children have been able to close that earlier chapter of their lives. I don't care about what she did in her past. I'm not looking to find out what she had done or anything else. I want to know who she is, and I want to know her side of the family so I can tell them this lady has died. Because as far as I know, nobody knows. Update. Daryl Tacey's long search is finally over. On the night of our broadcast, a viewer called with the news that Georgia Ann Boyd's real name was Edith Geraldine Johns Moore. A few days later, Daryl, his stepdaughter Sally and Angel, and their children rendezvoused in Savannah, Georgia, anxiously awaiting a reunion with Edith's family. I was nervous about meeting these people. I didn't know how they would take this. Uh, I figured there'd be tears, and so I was really leery, scared, I guess you could call it. But after I met them, there were the tears, but I felt relieved finally to tell them she had passed away. The reunion was a poignant mix of sadness and joy. Perhaps the happiest moment was when Sally and Angel met their natural father, Gary Moore, for the first time since they were very young children, nearly 14 years ago. That's Grandpa Grandpa. <laughs> it was, and it still is unreal. I mean, it's hard to comprehend all this is happening. I found my two daughters after 15 years, plus I'm a grandfather twice over. That still takes a little getting used to. I'm too young to be a grandfather, but <laughs> I reckon I'll have to accept it. Sally and Angel received an even bigger surprise when they learned that their mother had two other children from a previous marriage, Eugene and Rhonda. By bringing together Sally and Angel with their blood relatives, Daryl felt he had finally fulfilled his obligation to his late wife. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk with, with the family and we may get together and just get to know each other. I think that's the first thing we have to do. 14 years is a long time. Next, a sheriff in Florida is seeking clues to the identity of a murder victim. Lake Panasofki lies in the heart of the vast Florida wetlands, 50 miles northwest of Orlando. It is a steamy, mysterious quagmire which covers 27 square miles. Crossing the lake's eastern shore in Sumter County is Interstate 75, a major highway connecting Florida with the rest of the southeast. On February 19, 1971, two teenagers were hitchhiking along the interstate, heading north from Tampa. While crossing the narrow Lake Panasofki Bridge, they noticed the outline of a human form in the shallow, murky water. Hey, look at that. What is 
Within an hour, authorities had been called to retrieve the badly decomposed body of a young woman. She appeared to have been strangled. A man's size 36 belt was still wrapped around her throat. Authorities determined that the woman may have been in her late teens or early 20s. She carried no identification and had been dead for approximately three weeks. Investigators were unable to find the killer or determine the woman's identity. Tragically, no one ever came forward to claim her body. Six months passed. The young woman was laid to rest beneath a small metal marker which simply read, Jane Doe, 1971. Ten years later, Jamie Adams became the sheriff of Sumter County. He began to review the department's unsolved cases and was particularly disturbed by the murder of the young woman. It bothered me the fact that, that this young girl had never been identified. And uh, being a, a daddy and a granddaddy, I just, I just couldn't, couldn't accept the fact that, uh, that somebody out there couldn't come forward and let us know who this young girl was. It's something that I had to do, and I just feel deeply that it's a mission that I've got to accomplish. Each year, law enforcement is faced with thousands of cases similar to the murder mystery in Florida. But some are so senseless and heart-wrenching that an investigation will often turn into a personal crusade. For the past decade, Sheriff Jamie Adams has engaged the foremost experts in the country to find out everything he possibly can about the young woman he calls Little Miss Panasofsky. A year after he took office, Sheriff Adams officially reopened the case. He obtained a court order to have the body exhumed. Dr. William Maples, one of the nation's foremost forensic anthropologists, was brought in to assist in the new investigation. The re-examination of the remains ordered by Sheriff Adams gave us a piece of information that is crucial, something that wouldn't have been known had it not been for Sheriff Adams. And that was that she had orthopedic surgery to her right ankle the surgery done to the right ankle of this young woman was required because of instability in that ankle. This was done by an orthopedic surgeon who wound a tendon through holes drilled in the bones of the ankle. It is a Watson-Jones or modified Watson-Jones technique. The family or the physician may remember this. Sheriff Adams next contacted Linda Gallinier a forensic artist renowned for her ability to create accurate composite drawings based on human remains. One of the first things we do are get photos of the skulls, and it's important for those to be to scale, the same size of the skull. We use the crime lab to do that, and they bring forth the profiles and facial front of the skulls themselves. Then an artist will sit down and will put either tissue paper or some type of uh, matte acetate over it so we can still see the photograph but draw. And we actually plot the tissue depth using these charts, and you just mold that face until it comes to life on paper. Little Miss Panasofsky was beginning to come alive for Sheriff Adams. Next, he asked Linda Gallinier to attempt something she had never done before, create age regression drawings, approximating how the victim might have appeared first at the age of 12, then at the age of six. This pioneering technique had never before been used in law enforcement. Maybe my, my people that I was trying to locate hadn't seen Miss Panasofsky for several years. She could have been uh, uh, any of numerous things that she hadn't been in touch with a loved one for several years. So I needed something that I could put her back in time with the hopes that maybe a, a school teacher, Sunday school teacher, or even a classmate that had went to school with us, say when she's in the fifth grade or the first grade that would remember. Sheriff Adams has mailed flyers to more than 3,000 law enforcement agencies throughout the United States and Canada. He has contacted hundreds of hospitals, followed up hundreds of leads. Still, the identity of Little Miss Panasofsky remains a mystery. I know that there's, there's a parent, there's a, there's a loved one, there's a mother, a father, an aunt, maybe even a Sunday school teacher somewhere that, that knows and loves this young girl. And I think I owe it to them to try to, to identify this young girl and, and get her buried in the rightful place and take her home. 
Sheriff Adams believes that the young woman may have been of Native American heritage. She stood five feet two inches tall, weighed 100 pounds, and was approximately 20 years old. In addition to the Watson Jones surgical technique that had been performed on her ankle, the young woman had extensive dental work, including crowns, caps, and fillings. Sheriff Adams does not rule out the possibility that she was a runaway. The body of little Miss Panasofsky was discovered in February of 1971. Nearly 20 years later, the complete physical examination revealed that she had given birth to at least one child, which means that somebody, somewhere, may have grown up without ever knowing what happened to his or her mother. Join me next time for these intriguing new stories. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery.